that? Who's that? What you want? Police. We've had some complaints about con men pretending to be blind and uh, crippled. Oh, I'd love to help you, man, but I ain't seen nothing since I stepped on that landmine in Viet Cong back in 72. It was rough, very painful. You were in Nam? So were we. Where? Um, I was in, um, Sang Bang, Dangan. Uh, uh, I was all over that place, basically. A lot of places. A lot of places. I can see! I can see! I have le- Hello and welcome to the Benjamin Movie Club. My name is Ben, my name's Charlie, and today we're talking about the 1983 classic Trading Places, starring Dan Aykroyd, Eddie Murphy, and Jamie Lee Curtis. And oh, we've got those other well. people in there, in there as well. But oh yeah, but of course we'll Dan get Ak- to that. We'll get to that. Oh. A bit. Okay, well actually, we might as well, we'll do that now. Okay, no, no, go on, go on. We'll do Dan Aykroyd, who was from Blues Brothers, Ghostbusters, My Girl, Dragnet, Spies Like Us. Michael Two, right? Okay, yep. Eddie Murphy from Beverly Hills Cop, Coming to America, Shrek, Nutty Professor, Forty Eight Hours, yep. Jamie Lee Curtis from Halloween, True Lies, A Fish Called Wanda, Freaky Friday, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, yep. And what are you going to add to that? I wasn't because the thing is, you know what? Out of all the actors I've written down. Hers is the only one. I didn't bother putting. The, I didn't bother writing the films because I thought Ben knows enough of her films anyway. Right. Okay. I only write the other ones in case you come up short. But I right. know you know her so well. Okay. Uh, there's uh, D- uh, Don Amish. Yeah. From Cocoon, Heaven Can Wait, Homeward Bound. Also from Girl Trouble, and from a film called Moon Over Miami, which is oh, where, I remember that. where Nan. I remember of that. Nan. That's where Nan got the Moon Over Miami recipe from. Is that with the egg and yeah. the bread? Eggy bread or whatever. Is that, um, I think that was filmed is. in Mi- yeah, Miami, obviously. It sounds like that. I think I stayed in the hotel that was filmed in or something. Mm. I think. It's an old black and white film, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realise he was an old black and white actor until I actually sort of looked into this. Mm. Obviously, he's old in this. With him, with Donna Mesh, um, John Landis thought he'd be great for the part, but he died years ago. Yeah, he thought he was dead. He thought he was dead <laughs> yeah, because we hadn't that. worked so long. And then... A f- someone got wind and said, no, he's down so-and-so, and he went and met him, and the guy just basically said, well, no-one's offering me roles anymore. I mean, this is a great role for him. Oh, it's fantastic. He's yeah. really good in this film. He's, he's really good. Yeah, he's only... Um, he was only a, a few years younger, I think four years younger than the other brother, but I think the other brother, who's played by Ralph Bellamy, looks a lot older, I think. Mm. You know, it's more like... It's a bit like Fraser and Niles, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's more like our age gap. But yeah, that Donna Mesh, he died of prostate cancer in 1993, age 85. That's 10 years after this film. Oh, OK. Yeah, because I think Cocoon and all that, that was in the 80s, and he sort mm. of got a new lease of life. Coming to America, Cocoon. Oh, that was all like... So after this film, he sort of started working again. But then, yeah, I suppose you yeah, didn't see him after that, much after the 80s, because obviously he died. Mm. There was also his brother, Ralph Bellamy. Well, his, his brother in this. Not his brother in real life. Um, he was from His Girl Friday, The Wolfman, Pretty Woman. Uh, he died of a lung ailment in 1991, aged 87. So he only died a couple of years uh, before, before Donna Mesh. Was he in Pretty Woman? Who was he in Pretty Woman? He was the old guy. Um, also, Denholm Elliott, who's in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. A Room with a View. I'm sure. What else Ra- is Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously, as well. That was the other um, okay. Indiana Jones. Zulu Dawn. He was also done the voice of Cowslip in Warship Down. Okay. Yeah. Which is connected to one of our previous podcasts. He died of AIDS in 1992. Age Did he? 70. Mm. So not long after this. Oh, okay. It was only like seven well, years. AIDS, AIDS was, quite, uh, it was quite bad, wasn't it, in the mm. 80s? And I mean, is it? Yeah, I think that's, that's when Kenny Everett and and Freddie Mercury. I think they died. It was the nineties, mm. so it was like that was basically. I think they got the medication or that sort of not long after. Yeah, which is a shame because I mean we lost so many like great artists. I mean Fred, Freddie Mercury and Kenny Everett was but, amazing. Yeah, but this uh, Den Holm Hudson died of AIDS. I think didn't he? Yeah, he was on the earlier ones, weren't yeah. he? Yeah. 
It's also got uh, Robert Earl Jones, who's got a small part, he's an attendant. He was uh, Coleman in The Sting. Uh, are you having are you haven't watched I haven't seen The Sting, no. Well, that'll be one we'll do, so it'll probably come back to this. Is that from the 70s? 60s. 60s. Yeah. I've heard of it, and I can't think why I've heard of it. Robert Redford, Paul Newman. Anyway. Oh, okay. It's also got a small cameo by Giancarlo Esposito, who's one of the cellmates. So, you know, when Eddie Murphy's talking about, yeah, I've done Kung Fu and yeah, stuff, you've got yeah. the one standing exactly to his left. Right. That's um, Giancarlo Esposito, who's oh, yeah, come yeah, up yeah, a few times. Him, yeah. He's in Desperately Seeking Susan. Oh, I'm joking, is he really? Yeah. Okay. He always, remember we were saying, he was, he was you know, the person she bumps into, the store owner now on Desperately Seeking Susan. He's right. like, hey, you got both. Yeah. That was him. Then he went on to Unusual Suspects. Oh, so he's one of them that he has his yeah. little little cameos in all these big big. No, no, no. He's, he's 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 started becoming bigger and bigger. He was in Derailed. He plays Detective Church in Derailed. He was in Do the Right Thing. He was quite big in Bugging Out and in Breaking Bad. He was the the gangster who gets blown half his face off. Right, okay. that's him. So you can okay. see his career has slowly improved yeah. over time. But so these started early... with a couple of little one liners yeah. in the film, like in this and. But it's, it's interesting to see his career, how it started from all these little extra yeah. parts, and you can trace it, so it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger until he's like the main So villain. was it just like the little one-liner sort of characters? Yeah, like usually, like beginning. in this and Desperately Seeking Susan. And, and probably and, others as well. That oh, yeah, there's loads, which I haven't... Yeah. yeah. You've got Kristen Holly, who, she, from the look of it, she only done two films. she done this. She plays Penelope, his fiancée. Oh, his fiancée, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was also in Manhunter. She was quite good in this, though. She was very believable as that sort of little snobby... Well, sort of maybe that's spoiled, what she was like. Spoiled little rich girl kind of thing. She was quite a believable character, is that? You had Frank Oz, um, was what the, one of the, the corrupt cop. No, the one giving back. Yeah. PCP, Angel Dust. Yeah. That's him, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Who's obviously... Him and he got a lot of cameos. Because he was in American Werewolf, which was John right. Landis's previous film to this, wasn't it? Oh, is it, it just to do with John Landis? That, what, the yeah, it's like friendship. Because he was friends with it. So like. it's like me keep sticking you or yeah. Mike in my films yeah. for cameos. You also had Bo Diddy, uh, played the pawn, um, pawn broker. Bo Diddley, played the pawn broker. Arlene Sorkin, um, she played... One of the women at the party. Okay. Okay, so Arlene Sorkin, she was like the original Harley Quinn. And she was also as Cal- Calope Jones in Days of Our Lives. She was married to producer, not actor, producer Christopher Lloyd, who's the one who produced Fraser. Fraser. I always wondered what that Christopher Lloyd... Yeah, it's not... I thought, it's, is that him no, out, of, one, out of Back yeah. to the Future? Because whenever I see Fraser, yeah. and it says Christopher Lloyd, and I thought, I need to look that up one day. Um, she died... This year, August okay. 26th, so not that long ago either. How old was she then? Uh, she was 67. Oh, so not old then? Yeah, she, um, she it was complications from pneumonia and multiple sclerosis. That's a shame. Yes, sir, yeah. Um, also, had Paul Gleason from Breakfast Club. Yes, he's the he's the cop, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's a uh, no, not the cop. Meek, he's Beaks, the he's, Meeks. yeah, the guy who they send to do who gets who, who gets who, um, romantically involved against his will <laughs> with, with the gorilla. gorilla. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was also in Arthur and not another team movie. He he sort of done his Breakfast Club yeah. role. He died. He, he's dead. I know he died a long time. Yeah, ago. he died in two thousand six. He yeah. was sixty seven. I remember Sad when thing he died. is. He died three weeks after being diagnosed with mesothelioma, which is a rare form of lung cancer. Oh, so it's okay. obviously a very aggressive one. They would have told him, you've got weeks to live. That's terrible. Oh, you think, what, yeah, what terrible. a horrible death sentence on people. Mm. You also had uh, James Belushi. He was on the train, wasn't he? He was the original gr- party man gorilla. Monkey! Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really funny in that. And that's that's John Belushi's part. brother, isn't it? Yeah, and John Belushi would have died only probably about six months before they started filming this yeah. as well. So he was in Red Heat, K9, Salvador. You also had... John Belushi was quite young when he died, wasn't he? When he was about the fir- yeah. early 40s or 30s. Yeah, he's about the same age as Dan Aykroyd. Uh, you also had Richard Hunt, who, at the very end of the film, you know when the Duke brothers, yeah. Mortimer and... What's the other one's name? Oh. Randolph. Right. Randolph and Mortimer, when they send that guy down to the pit, goofy looking guy, he's going, okay, I'll go, bye, and he's yeah. trying, and he ends up fainting. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's Richard Hunt. He sadly died 7th of January 1992, age 40. 
So he would only so. been about 30 in this, or just like early 30s. He, yeah, he was playing the part of Wilson. You know what he was known for? He was one of the original voice cast of the Muppets. As well, of he done Scooter, Statler. So he was the original Statler okay. up until like about ninety two. Oh, so right, from okay. the Muppet movie M- Muppets Take Manhattan, he done their voices Janice, the hippie, okay. yeah. Beaker, and Sweetums. So we, all of them. Oh, that Sweetums. was him. Uh, Sweetums is the big, the big sort of monstery one, isn't it? Sweetums. Yeah, yeah. And also he done uh, the Junior Gorg from uh, Fraggle Rock. Okay. Yeah. So he was like a big mainstay, as much as Frank Oz or Jim Henson were. Okay. But obviously, people with Jim Henson dying similar time to him, I think just Jim Jim Henson died before Richard Hunt, I believe. Yeah. What did he die of? Uh, Jim Henson. No, this. Or Richard Hunt. It's like a uh, natural death or something. It's weird because he was very young. He was only like 40, but I'm, I'm sure they said it was just like an unexplained death. Uh, or something. It's. You get a lot of that though, didn't you? There's been a lot of that lately. Last couple of years, people just dying and they're going all just, mm. just uh, unknown circumstances. It's like yeah. oh, it's a bit creepy. You wonder what it could be. Mm. Anyway, right. I can't imagine. Um, no. <laughs> right. Um, it was one of the biggest box office hits of 1983, which you can sort of see that. Mm. It is a fantastic film. Uh, and it is like a Christmassy film, obviously, because it's got like the Christmassy theme at oh, yeah, the end of it. It's much more Christmassy than I gave it credit for before, because I mm. thought. But the whole film is pretty much a few days leading up to Christmas. It is. Um, and the weather as well. It's all snowy and yeah, cold. It is quite Christmassy. Well, Philadelphia is quite cold anyway, I guess. Yeah. Did you also know um, part of the film was actually shot during the real life trading hours of the World Trade Center? No. Do you I know did, that? I did not know that. Why Tell are you me smirking, man. It's <laughs> just very funny the way you said it. <laughs> yeah, now, um, yes, yeah, so it's actually set up, it's filmed in the World Trade Centre. I No, that wasn't. I doubt the inside. Oh, actually, no, it was. It says it goes yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, sorry. It, it was, was actually filmed uh, during the real life trading hours too... at, the, at the World Trade Centre, which is the Twin Towers, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yes. So I didn't know. So that was what the Twin Towers was about. Yeah. It wasn't about. No, that's what I'm saying. It had all the. Yeah. All the um, yeah. trading, it makes oh, sense because it was called the world. Uh, all right, okay, I'm sort of saying that. <laughs> Sound a bit. That's why but... they crashed into them. That's why they supposedly crashed into them to destroy America's economy because right. that's the trading pit. That's where everyone was trading. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. But I'd cut, as I said, I'd cut that out. Why? Because people go. Fuck it. Right. Yeah. But did you know Big Ben's got a clock on it? It's like... <laughs> Yeah, Big Ben actually ain't a clock. It's a bell. It's the bell. It's the bell. Yeah, right. everyone knows that. That's what I'm saying. So you did, not Listen, you can edit this how you want. I've I've got no egg <laughs> on my face, so it's up to you. It's written by Timothy Harrison, Herschel Wellgood. They also wrote Brewster's Millions, Twins, Space Jam, Kindergarten Cop, and they produced together Falling Down, which I really like. Directed by Josh Falling Schmitt. Down, is that Michael Douglas? Yeah. That's when he just loses it with everyone. I definitely it? want to do that one. That's quite a good yeah. film, from what I remember. When yeah. he, he goes in the burger place and he gets a Big Mac or so, a burger or whatever, and he goes and he looks at the picture and he goes, that, that's, yeah. that doesn't look like that. Yeah. Like, he sort of loses everything, he just pulls everything apart, he yeah. just loses it at Monday, and he just goes, nah, I ain't taking it no more. It's quite a good film. I think Tristan um, uh, got you into, got into that film. Yeah, that's my. F- I think that's probably my favourite Michael Douglas. Performance. Uh, you know what? I think I've only seen it once, and I've been talking about maybe probably well, about twenty years, years ago. ago. About twenty it came years out ago. About thirty. Or no, years but I think ago. I see it about twenty years ago, right. maybe a lot longer. Lewis's uh, rest number was a tribute to John Belushi uh, as Jake Blues. Oh really? You know the, the picture of Jake Blues oh, in mugshot when yeah, he gets yeah, yeah. in Blues Brothers. The same, um, oh. the same number was used in that as what Lewis has got when he's arrested for being a pimp. Oh. <laughs> this was conceived as a project for Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. After, a, a, after, a, sorry, I can see that, but this this pairing is so much better. Yeah. I think they would have been a bit too. Well, what had happened? Comical. No, they would have gone with them, but it was about this time, or oh, that uh, Richard Pryor got. He, what did he do? Hold on. Richard Pryor severely injured himself after um, freebasing cocaine and he set himself on fire. Oh, fuck, did he? Yeah, he was right into all that kind of stuff. He talked about it, he does stand up afterwards saying. Richard Pryor. How fucked up do you have to be to do, set yourself on fire? Uh, 
<laughs> no, that was B car. <laughs> that's my impression of B car. Um, so that's when the studio went, oh, you know what, let's not have him. And John Landis wanted to work with Dan Aykroyd again because they worked with him on Blues Brothers. But the studio was unwilling because they thought, well, no, he's part of a double act. Yeah, they didn't know if he was going to yeah. be able to carry it off without uh, John Belushi. Yeah. The studio was also unimpressed with Eddie Murphy. They'd seen 48 Hours and they didn't think much of him. But there was positive previews uh, made them change their mind. So then they said to John Landis, how about Eddie Murphy? And he was like, well, who's that? So... He saw the film, he went, and he was impressed with Eddie Murphy's audition tape, and he yeah. thought, yeah, he's going to be great. They also objected to Jamie Lee Curtis. They thought she was just going to be another screen queen. Yeah, because all she'd she ever done, she'd done Fog, <laughs> Halloween 1 and 2. What was the other horror film she'd done? Oh, Prom Night. Right. So she, that's all she'd done. All she'd done was horror stuff. And she actually said that uh, John Landis changed her the path of her career. Yeah, she will always. She always says you changed the direction of my lot, my because it was all horror films. Yeah, she was a screen queen. I don't think she done anything other than that. And he was like, "Is that all? The, that's what mm-hmm. she's about." But he could see, and she's fantastic in this film. She's, yeah, and she is really good in this. And what it shows is when you're connected to a successful comedy. Yeah, and she wasn't seen as a weak part in it. I went, "No, she was really good. She yeah. nailed it." Yeah, I, that it, leads it, on to. Fish called Wanda. Yeah. So then she does Fish it called opened, Wanda. Uh, it yeah. opened everyone's eyes and looked at it. It's like, it's like she was brand new, because a lot yeah. of people don't know horror. So if you didn't know horror, then you wouldn't even know who she was. So no. this would have been the first film that people would have seen her in. And she was fantastic in it. She plays the role mm. perfectly. She looks perfect for the role. She, it, it was good for her to step outside the box. I don't look at her in this and look at her as though out of Halloween. She doesn't remind no. me anything about so, Laurie Strode at all in this film. Yeah. That's what so, she does in Halloween. She's a completely different character. She looks different. Mm. Well, so this is exactly, this was a good break for her. Because if yeah. you ask anyone who's not a horror fan, yeah. if you said to them, oh, you know, who's that signing autographs? Heather Langenkamp. They'll go, yeah. who's, who's that? that? Yeah. Because she's only done, yeah. horror. she's known for her horror. Yeah. She, no doubt she would have tried one or two other things. Yeah. But unfortunately, if you're really popular in horror, which Jamie Lee Curtis was. She's very good in comedy, Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm. And then that this opened people's eyes to yeah. the comedy part of her. It's like when she does the, the Swedish uh, <laughs> accent, which she done because she couldn't do a German accent. Yeah, she couldn't do the Austrian. Yeah, yeah. She couldn't do Austrian so accent. she thought, I'll do, uh, I'll just do Swedish. Yeah. And they wrote into it. So yeah. they had with the, um, the butler guy and... But you're, you're German, wearing Leidenhosen. Yeah. You're wearing Leidenhosen. It's pretty good, from yeah. Sweden. It's in Sweden. But he's funny. It's made for the Sweden. He's funny. He's funny. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. It was originally called Black and White, but Landis didn't like the title. So I think Trading Places is much better. Oh, Trading Places is much better. It's a cleverer title because yeah. obviously it's got multiple meanings and it meant they could have great fun with like all the taglines and stuff. Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And I love the um, the poster, the, the original poster for it. Where yeah. they're both in the bathroom and they're looking in the, their reflections in the mirror mm. and it's like the opposite reflection of them. It's like he's seen himself as poor and he's seen himself as rich and you've got the two old men looking over the t- toilet cubicles. That, yeah, that's a great poster. That's, yeah. that's a poster I've that's actually the best, got. That's the best one. I've actually got that poster on my wall. Yeah. I've, and I picked like about uh, 10 posters from the 80s, which I didn't go for the obvious ones. I thought everyone knows this one, everyone knows Back to the Future or whatever. I picked some more slightly more random but still equally if not better than the other ones the ones yeah. that everyone knows yeah. so like Adventures in Babysitting with them climbing up the side of the tower I've yeah. got that one because I think that's a great poster yeah. uh, Big Trouble in Little China I like all that's the good, colours yeah. and it's got the, the Chinese wizard behind it and your how the duck one is it's how... not the usual how the duck one it's not like the beak with the cigar coming out of the, yeah. the egg Exactly, and I, I had to look hard for that because if you look up a Howard the Duck poster, which I know most people won't, but if you do, it's always the one with the egg and the beak. Yeah. But I like this one where he's sitting there with a newspaper, so you can just see his web feet. Yeah. Or he's, I think it's like Rolling Egg magazine, something like that. Yeah. And I just thought it looked much better, so I had to get that. It was different material. But yeah, the Trading Places one in there, and like Howard the Duck, it's not the one you see most. No, no. It's usually you see one of them hugging and all money, and I think that sort of doesn't do the film service the, the film's good enough that it's better yeah. than all those other ones you know, yeah, I definitely. think it's better than Brewster's Millions oh yeah it is, you know? it is. It's, 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 I think it stands out I mean also the fact that it, it sort of ties into Christmas mm. keeps it relevant as well because each year people bring it out as a classic Christmas film so that's also but the, the thing is it's, it's aged really well 
Mm. Apart from, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't... I, I mean, I look at it and I think it's brilliant, but I can see that, you know, things that might have been acceptable back then ain't acceptable now. I don't think it was meant in a, no, in I a think... bad way. I really don't. And Which is, obviously, people might realise we're talking about the scene at the end in the carriage... Where Dan Aykroyd, where Dan Aykroyd is um, dressed done. up as a... Um, what is he? Like a... The scene at the end where Dan Aykroyd does blackface and plays part of a Rastafarian. Yeah. Um, I, it's hard to justify it because they had no sort of lead-up. They didn't even have a line saying, he'll recognise you, you've got to go over the top. Yeah. Um, or like you could have had a scene where Eddie Murphy is joke goading him into it. You've got to do this. Something like that might have justified it more, but the fact that this character suddenly walks in talking with a Jamaican accent... Yeah. And it, I know... I mean, you wouldn't do it now. No, I think Dan Aykroyd at the time, he had a few Saturday Night Live sketches before that a few years earlier because he was, like, from the first generation Saturday Night mm. Live like with Chevy Chase and Steve Martin and, you know, then Bill Murray came along, John Belushi, so all these big, huge names. He had, like, these sketches where he'd, he'd do a Jamaican accent, so he obviously mm. fancied himself quite adapt to it. Then you had... The good, interesting connection with that is then Saturday Night Live was pretty much going to get cancelled because they after all them ones left and went off to make films be successful the next batch were rubbish they was trying yeah. too hard and they reckon the person who saved Saturday Night Live was Eddie Murphy because he was one of the right. new ones who came okay. in and he just stole the show and then that's what then saved Saturday Night Live and it gave him the catapult into this career right okay so, so when they sure. both cast their knees in this film it was like old Saturday Night Live and new Saturday Night Live together okay and they obviously got. I think on. they work really well together. I think they work really. They, they, they I, I prefer this match rather than uh, Gene Wilder and John Pryor. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. <laughs> Richard, yeah. Pryor Richard Pryor. I prefer this match. This match is I. I like. I mean, it might have worked the other way around, but I like these two together. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that that scene at the end, obviously, it hasn't gone. That that doesn't go down too well. Do they cut that scene out now? I. I, I, hope I don't not. think you can. I, you can't because it's because so it's pivotal. quite important to the actual role because he changes. I think they might have, they might thin it down a lot. The only thing they could do is so they get on the train as the party go in, and then um, they could have when Eddie Murphy comes in does like as the African student. They could somehow do some editing as if the close up of the bag swapping. Yeah. And or like he runs off to the toilet and gives the bag to Dan Aykroyd in the toilet, but you don't see him, do you? No. You just, he's like, he keep, there's that knock and goes, open the damn door. Mm. From hands in the bag, they could have ended it there, and then you wouldn't have. You just go for oh, that's them. Getting then you don't get all the Jamie Lee Curtis Swedish bits and no. all that. But and this I is it. You have such a huge sacrifice, and you wouldn't have loads of the bits after that. I like so many quotable bits of that. Loads of them from James Belushi. Yeah, like I never. Bit, you know, the thing is, I never really noticed it. No. I never noticed it. I mean, obviously, I suppose just the area you grew up, grew up in, I didn't really notice a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, okay, it's definitely not acceptable nowadays. Oh, um, I don't think yeah. it was meant in a derogatory way. I know people well, might, you... might disagree with that, but I don't think it was meant in a... I don't think they was trying to offend people. No, I you think was, at the end of the day... It they, was like a joke yeah. that, 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 they, they that felt to... that didn't fall down too well. It hasn't aged very well. Yes, they was trying to make people laugh. That's all they was doing. Yeah. They weren't trying to hurt anyone or offend anyone. They no. simply was trying to make people laugh. Yeah. And they thought, wouldn't it be funny, Dan Aykroyd in blackface doing a Jamaican accent yeah. because it's not expected. And where Eddie Murphy would have been on board with it because, again, at the time, it was one of those things, it was on every other channel, people yeah. doing things like that. Even years no, later, you've got to think... That things have changed so much. You've got to think, it's like um, 20 years after that, they were still doing things like Little Britain... And both selected. Oh, up. yeah. I so mean, Little Britain, that was a lot later. But you look than... at Little Britain, and it's mm. like, you can't show that sketch, can't show it. That's why they don't show it no more. No, and that is just really crash. Cr that's really crass humour yeah. you know, with that stuff. It was just deliberately making fun of person, whereas this, at least it's somehow written into the story. Yeah. He's got to go undercover. Maybe if he's this outlandish Jamaican guy, the guy won't even look at him. But uh, yeah, I don't know if they cut it now. I mean, I I would still like to. I, I love it in, in its entirety. You know, I think it's a good film. Um, yeah, so as I say, certain bits like same with a lot of films. Those little f things that ain't that don't age well uh, with a lot of stuff nowadays. But you know, you have got to take it and appreciate it for what it was, what it was, how it was meant at the time. Mm. Yeah. So 
Uh, did you know uh, Sir John Gilgood was offered the role, uh, was offered Denholm Elliott's role? Mm. They're very sort of similar kind of actors as well. They're very similar. You know who else was offered characters. it? Who else? Ronnie Barker. Oh, was he really? Ronnie Barker was the first person that he approached for the role. Really? Yeah. And he refused the role because of the distance. He said he wouldn't travel seven miles out of, outside bet, of London. I bet he wish he'd done it. I think, and this is the thing, like when I was watching it today with Mum, and I was watching it and I was like, imagining Ronnie Barker in a role. It's not a big part, but it's an important part yeah. because he helps them get revenge. Yeah. And I think with his, he's such a good actor, Ronnie Barker, yeah. such a good comedic yeah. actor. He's not over the top. He's perfect to transition yeah. to film. I think he would have been really good alongside Eddie Murphy yeah. and Dan Aykroyd. People would have gone, I love the butler in uh, Trading Places. Oh, it's and a shame. Gone, oh, yeah. But he was good, though. Um, oh, yeah, he was, uh, he was Dan great. was very good. Yeah, but, and he, he was still known before that for Last Crusade and Raiders, but it would have been nice for this to have been Ronnie Barker's... It would have been interesting to, to see, yeah. Because he would have probably built off that, had a few more American roles before he sadly died as well. What year did he die? Was that 92, you said, didn't you say 92? No, oh, Ronnie, Ronnie Barker, I think that was might be a little bit later. Yeah. Right, 90s, I think, maybe. I don't know. No, you know what? I think I've never seen him quite old. I think he's died recently. No, it's about, at least no. about 15 years ago. Mm. I would say. Let's have a look. 2005. See, I was right. Yeah, I said 15 years, so it's 18 years ago. So it's similar, quite so close. He, he could have had, like, a big film career, really. Yeah. I remember seeing a thing with him, interviewing him once. He said he'd only now do a film if he got to star alongside Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, and Marlon Brando. Okay. Nothing when you're getting ahead of yourself there a bit. But. <laughs> the writers got drunk with real traders for research, mm. so sort of to sort of see how they work on the um, on the trading floor. John Landis chose "The Marriage of Figaro" by Mozart for the opening music which I've had in my head all day now, as he liked using classical music to represent pompous elitists. Yeah. Yeah. It won two BAFTAs, which is good, which was um, supporting actress Jamie Lee Curtis. So, I mean, she really... This really blew up her career. This suddenly you made her... Eh? Did you say one? Yeah. Oh, BAFTAs, sorry. It won two BAFTAs. What were yeah. you talking about? I was, I was looking at the Oscars. Yeah. Did it, win in, it didn't win no Oscars, did it? No, it... Go on, finish what you right, said. I said it, was, it won two BAFTAs, and I, it was the best supporting actress, Jamie Lee Curtis, and supporting actor, oh, which was um, Sir John Gilgood. Oh, sorry, Denholm Elliott. Who <laughs> wasn't in it. Who wasn't even in it, yeah. <laughs> Denholm Elliott. Uh, Elmer Bernstein was Oscar nominated for the best score. Right. Well, the Duke Brothers return as vagrants in Coming to America. Yeah, I like that. And they are also referenced in Coming to America too. Which only came out a few years ago because it's got like they they've they obviously they built up the business again because it's got like their grandson going. When my grandfather's built Duke and Duke, it's got a big painting of them. Yeah. Like, oh, so they're supposed to have gone up again. Yeah. The so they they went back up in the world. Yeah, I didn't. I, I mean, coming to America, I only watched that recently, probably about five years ago, because yeah. I thought everyone was saying oh, it's so good, it's so good, it's okay. It's not no way near as good for me as Trading Places. Mm. I just doesn't. It just didn't. I prefer didn't Trading Places to I've, me. I prefer Trading Places, but I wouldn't put Coming to America that far behind it. I think they're they're both very good, very similar sense of humour. Yeah. You know, it was okay. I don't get me wrong. It was okay, but it's, I've not craved to watch it again. But you only watched Trading it recently. Places. That's about five years ago. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Cinema's changed so much. Then maybe if you'd watched it back in the eighties or Probably. early nineties, you might have gone, hey, "I like this. This is a bit like Trading Places." It's like if you watch Trading Places now, if a new person, young person, listened to it. They probably wouldn't like the pacing. Yeah. They'd say, "Where's the person walking in the room with like his knob hanging out or something like that?" No, mm. like all that American Pie type humour, which yeah. then became popular. Whereas this one, it's sort of John Landis takes his time with certain things. It's not got to be a punchline every single scene. No, it can be building character like her uh, her uh, relationship with Dan Aykroyd, Jamie Lee Curtis and Dan Aykroyd. It's nice relationship. How they sort of, yeah, how she takes pity on him and how she looks after him when he's not well. And all, all this is, and it's believable and it's not like them constantly trying to sort of make She had jokes. an amazing figure, didn't she, Jamie Lee Curtis? Absolutely stunning figure. Yeah. Absolutely she... beautiful figure, which is completely hidden in all the horror films that she's done. And not in this, she just takes her top off in the first five minutes. I think that's the, that's the only time that she does. Sort of... Well, she does it twice in the film. Does she? She takes her clothes off again to get in bed with him. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. But she's like, I know, I think this sort of, this catapulted her career. Yeah. This really did, because it showed her, it did, it showed her in a different way, a different light. She was like a brand new actress to some people, mm. because they wouldn't have seen her in nothing else. 
Oh know? yeah, those well, there's loads of people refuse point blank to watch horrors. Yeah. And I, I don't care how good the story is. I'm not watching horror films. Don't like them. Think they're evil and all stuff like yeah. this. And I've known a few people in our life like Kurt don't watch horror films. Does yeah. he? He don't like horror. No. Who else doesn't like horror? I know there's a few people. I think those who don't like horror, does she? There's loads of people I know who they go. I tell them about a film, and they went, "Oh no, I don't like horrors." Yeah. They've heard of the film, like you say, Exorcist or Shining. Yeah. No, I ain't watching that. I don't. And isn't it amazing what a haircut can do for someone? How different she looks with that haircut. Yeah, she cut out for this, didn't yeah. she? As opposed, and it actually really suits her. Yeah, the short haircut really suits her face. The long hair in Halloween doesn't at all. It's like, but it was right for the era. It was very similar oh, yeah. to the style. Of you know, the short hair wouldn't have worked in Halloween. You know, that no. would have looked the same character. Don Amici, who plays Mortimer, hated foul language and he'd only performed the line, fuck him, once. Where, at the end of the film, his brother's keeling over and they said, he's, he's dying. And he goes, fuck him. <laughs> yeah. oh, my. And his he's, he's delivery of it is perfect. Yeah. But they only shot that once. Cause and he, he apologised, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because he was, he, was, he was proper old school. He's like proper old mm. granddad. Oh, sorry, I don't like saying language like this kind of thing, you know, and he apologise to yeah. the crew, but it's brilliant. And he the says, way he, his delivery, as you say, he's fantastic at that. And he says the N-word a few times as well. So, so that's another thing with the date. But dating. It's, it's perfect for them because that's how they would have been. There's yeah. these old, yeah. racist, white people. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. Rich, and they look down on... on Black people. That's actually, yeah, I so suppose I think it's, it, it, it's, it's in typing, it's, yeah. in, it's, in, it's in character with them people because that's the kind of people they are. Yeah, and it, was, and it works the way it punctuates the scene, even when Dan Aykroyd says it when he's laying in bed. Yeah. You know, well, he doesn't say the N word, he yeah. doesn't, a version of it. And he says there was this of awful yeah. N word. And it looks and you see Eddie Murphy there, it's perfect timing. You see Eddie Murphy's face drop as if, like, yeah. why did you have to say that? Yeah. And then he attacks him. It's, yeah. it's brilliant comic, comedy. Yeah. Yeah. It? it wouldn't work if it's you a brilliant. It is a brilliant film. I mean, as I say, I watched it uh, the other day. Still fantastic film. It's a lovely feel-good film. I love the ending. I love the way that it all sort of turns around. And I love the way that the characters both fall apart at the beginning. Like, the snobby sort of Dan Aykroyd character. He sort of... He was a proper, like, arsehole. Yeah. You know, he's like one of these that you think are proper elitist, which I hate. And I love seeing him go down. Mm. But then he finds himself. Mm. So it actually done him a big favour by losing everything because he actually sort of became a, a more humanised. Yeah. He wasn't a caricature like the rest of his friends were. Yeah. You know, and then Eddie Murphy, rather than being his dad... Like when out, no, sorry, like when he's undressing to have sex and they're just standing there talking to each other. Yeah. Going, oh, yes. Blah, 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 blah. Exactly. It's like he's no passion there. He's just going through the motions. But his character completely changes and you actually become... He becomes likeable. Mm. So... It actually probably done him the best fee, the best favour in 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 the world because he was able to step outside the box. Same with Eddie Murphy. Mm. It's like they he was going in one direction. All of a sudden he's been given all these riches. Okay, it was for a bet. He didn't know that. But at and, first he starts stealing stuff. Yeah. And then later when he has the party, yeah, he's going. No, these ain't these ain't people. Yeah. Who's putting this out? He starts having yeah. more respect for himself and his environment. I love that. I love that. That sort of it just shows you how. Put these people in different classes, yeah. and how they uh, it is. It was it's really interesting to see, but they both turn out mm. really good human beings, and it's like, and I love the fact that they get their comeuppance. Well, you the, know, the old blokes. The reason I think this film works better then, and if they remade it, I know exactly where they'd go wrong with it, because with Eddie Murphy's character, what's good about him is, yeah, he's his faith and everything. When and then he gets the chance to show that he's good with the money and he hands the money over. But if you notice, when uh, Dan Aykroyd uh, comes back as the Santa and runs out, and they're like, you know, he's had a rough time and he's very sort of he's becoming like them. He's like, no, you can't be tolerant on them. Yeah, you know, throw, believe me, I know what I'm talking about. It's where I've come from. You got to come down hard on them, chuck them in jail. Yeah, he's being an ass now. Yeah, you know, I know to us, it's probably thinking, well, it makes sense. You've got to have that hard stance. But what it does well, it shows that Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy are as bad as each other. Yeah. And as good as each other. Yeah. Whereas if they'd done it now, they'd have him go, no, let's not throw the book at him. I'm a compassionate man. Because yeah, that, they'd be too I, worried. They don't, they don't need to touch this. This film no. is perfection. The cast is perfection. Okay, there's a couple of bits that are a bit questionable now, but I that, it doesn't ruin it for me at all. I love the film in its entirety. Yeah. I think it's it's a it's a it's a lovely feel good film, and it's a lovely happy ending, and it's just nice. It just makes you smile, and it's a Christmassy film. 
Yeah. And that's what I love about it. So I take it you feel the same about this film then? Oh yeah, I love this film. I remember this, watching this quite a lot when I was younger and then not seeing it for years, not thinking we had it. I did have this, I think I would have had this. For some reason, I couldn't find it in our video cabinet because we used to just have all, like, tapes. Yeah, but I used to buy all the stuff there and I used to record and yeah, I'd have them all numbered mm. in Mum's Chinese cabinet. She had a little Chinese cabinet there, didn't she? We know the all the embossed bits on it. And I used to have them all sideways, all the video cassettes, all like one, two, three, four, five. And I had a little book which I had written down. I used to love doing little things like that. Mm. The good old days. It's been compared with The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain, yep. as you can see, obviously, course, yeah. people sharing, swapping their places. Also, Mark Twain's 1893 short story, The Million Pound Banknote, in which two brothers bet on the outcome of giving an impoverished person an unusable million pound banknote. While filming the scene where Randolph and Mortimer collect Valentine from jail, Landis was positioned in a towing truck that pulled the Rolls Royce carrying Amesh, Bellamy and Murphy. Uh, he had to wear thick park and stay warm because it was this, it was freezing cold at the time. Everything was freezing up. They had a little space heater in their vehicle in front of the actors to try and keep them warm. Mm. And Landis listened to the dialogue via the radio and he said they were talking between the, the scenes and um, Landis recalled uh, that Amesh, Bellamy and Murphy, Bellamy say, said that Trading Places was his 99th film and Amesh said it was his 100th film so Murphy said to Landis, look, between the three of us, we've got 201 films, because it was only his second. <laughs> uh, with the IMDb, it got 7.5 out of 10. Mm. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, the critics give it 88%, and the audience give it 85%. That's good. So it's not bad, is it, really? Now, the budget, it was $15 million. It made $120.6 million. So that's a really good... That's really good. Really good return, isn't it? Well, it was, one of the, it was one of the best ones of the year, wasn't it? One of the highest grossing. Yeah, it was. That's correct, yeah. And I can see why, though. Yeah. Well, when good. did it come out? It came out like... 1983. Yeah, but do you know which month? I think it came out middle of the year. They always do this when it's Christmas films, and they're adding them... They, they just look at the time slot. They don't care. Well, it's like done well anyway, didn't it, really? released in the summer. Oh, was it? Yeah. But it is a Christmas film because although the film's story takes place over several weeks leading up to and after Christmas, it's still regarded as a Christmas film. Yeah. In 2008, the Washington Post called it one of the most underrated Christmas films. The Atlantic described it as a less traditional Christmas film, but one those whose themes remain relevant, particularly regarding the divide between the wealthy and the poor. Yeah. It's appeared on several lists of best Christmas films, including number five by Empire, number 12 by Entertainment Weekly, number 13 by Thrillist, Number 23 by Time Out, number 24 by Rotten Tomatoes, and number 25 by Today, and unranked by A Country Living in the Daily Telegraph. It's been a popular Christmas film on TV in Italy since its televised and debut in 1986, generally played on Christmas Eve. No, I can see that, though. I can mm. see that. Yeah, it's a really good film. And as I say, I still, still love it to this day, and it's one of the films that I can sit and watch again and again. I don't... I think it's a, it's a good story. It's good. It's well-written, well-acted. <laughs> It's definitely up there as one of my favourite Christmas films, although I don't think I've put it in at my top ten Christmas lists. I think list. I had this as my favourite Christmas film, didn't it I, did. on that Christmas list? I think this was it was a tough choice, but, I mean, watching it today, it automatically goes up higher. It's probably back in my top ten now. Yeah. But you find that sometimes. You watch something you ain't watched in ages, yeah. you think, oh, I love this. Yeah. You know. And it's nice coming up to Christmas bumps, especially if you're watching it round about that time. Mm. Speaking of which, next week, a week today is Christmas Eve. It's come around quick. <laughs> I know. Um, and I know you're going to do some Christmas shopping, aren't you? Yes. So I've arranged for Mike to come in and review our final Christmas film, which he's is going to be released. He's going to me next week, is he? He's going to play you, so he'll just keep talking over me whenever I'm talking. Yeah, so, 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 um, so as long as he gets that bit right. But also, there's another reason I wanted to get Mike in on this. The film I'm going to do is It's a Wonderful Life, which, as you know, I is one of my favourite Christmas films and one of my favourite films is... I, I love the film to bits. Yeah. And the only other person I've met who likes it as much as Mike, as much as me, probably even more than me, is Mike. Mike's yeah. seen it more than me. He loves it as well. He goes and watches it in the cinema every year. And he's also... I have seen that film. I just can't really remember it that well. I know it's sort of really sad and everything goes well, wrong. Well, you've got to watch it anyway. And then you can well, just... Well, I'm not reviewing it. I yeah, but you can watch still it, watch it. You've got to watch it because I'm going to ask you on the following one, say, so what did you think of it, Ben? What did you think I like, of it? Oh, yeah, it's really good. Anyway, should we talk about the podcast? No. We'll talk about that week then. Right. Yeah, no, no, that's a good, no, good choice, good shout. Yeah, so Charlie will be here next week. Yeah. So, yeah, you might, you might get a word in edgeways then. Well, 
<laughs> all right, <laughs> all right then. Thanks again for listening, and we will catch up with you soon. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. Look at the man I loved. Those children I wanted to have in breastfeed be a heroin dealer. It wasn't heroin. It was angel dust, PCP, and it... listen, Penelope. I swear to you, on my honor, with Almighty God as my witness, I am not an angel dust dealer. Lewis. I've been looking everywhere for you, baby. Listen, Lewis. Would you? I'm hurting, baby. I just need a show. Lewis. Who is this person? I've never seen this woman before in my life. Don't say it, baby. Come on, baby. Just a dime bag. I'll do all the things you like. I won't.